Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our chats with Emily. That's what we're calling our readings through all of the poems of Emily Dickinson contained in the Johnson edition. We turn now to poem 137, Flowers Well If Anybody. Now, we have here another flower poem. We've obviously seen this in a number of the preceding poems that we've studied. And this one will connect uh, actually quite nicely with the poem that follows in poem 138. Now, our assumptions are that you've been following our stuff at learnstrong.net down that left-hand side. Again, chats with Emily, our playlist. I'm hopeful that you've already been exposed to our set of introductory comments where, in those comments, we said, among other things, that Emily is often going to play the role of philosopher, of thinker, and we're going to see that here played out, I think, rather nicely in this poem and the poem to follow. She will, in fact, for the only time in her entire collection, use the term aesthetics. Now, I think that what Emily's playing with here is a return back to the classical tradition of Aristotle. We'll have more to say about that in a moment. I'm hopeful as well that you have been able already to work with the preceding 136 poems we just finished with, Have You uh, Got a Bra? Now, we, we're back to this idea of flowers. And Emily, of course, spent so much of her life, as we said in earlier lectures, in her father's garden. And she loves flowers. Here in this poem, she's going to make an interesting observation that flowers can bring both joy as well as sorrow. They're going to bring hope as well as sometimes a sense of uncertainty. Maybe we would even say despair. We are back to the sentiment as well of poem 26 that we've already seen. Now, aesthetic theory and the idea that there is something about the good, the, the true, and the beautiful. That notion of the beauty. What is it that is the value of beauty? You guys will remember in our comments at LearnStrong.net, we've given full lectures on Aristotelian poetics theory. And the idea that the protagonist will fall. We, of course, he, in that classic essay, will talk about Oedipus Rex, Oedipus the king. And how the protagonist, the one that the audience most identifies with, will fall. And in that process, there is, of course... Um, all kinds of catharsis that will happen. Uh, you'll remember pity or pathos will be elicited as well. We're going to get that notion as well here. And pathos will, in fact, get used in this poem. I also like her use of the word well in the first line. We'll have to talk about the very American way. It's a filler kind of, you know, you know how sometimes you'll have people go like this. So that well word here will be used in a similar way. Only time it gets used in all of her poetry is in this poem. Flowers. Well, if anybody can the ecstasy define, half a transport, half a trouble, with which flowers humble men, anybody find the fountain from which floods so contra flow, I will give them all the daisies which upon the hillside blow. Too much pathos in their faces for a simple breast like mine. Butterflies from San Domingo cruising round the purple line have a system of aesthetics far superior to mine. Now, Emily's always playing the game of what nature can teach us. I think she borrows heavily from her studies of Emerson in this regard. Notice she'll begin with flowers, flowers mentioned in 32 of her poems, and then the use of the word well with the dash on either side. It's as if, what game is she playing? It's as if she's playing this game like, well, what am I going to say about flowers? And ultimately, how can I move from the simple to the complex? As I've said, Emily the Romantic will always be playing this game of moving, much like Burns, much like Blake, poem, poets that we've uh, st uh, taught at LearnStrong.net, moving from the simple to the complex. In other words, most people just look at flowers as flowers, not Emily, <laughs> right? Emily will see flowers and say, hmm, what makes them beautiful? And what do I deduce uh, uh, as I begin the process of definition, defining my terms. And she says, well, if anybody, notice anybody re uh, repeated by uh, the fifth line, if anybody can the ecstasy define. Now, this word ecstasy is a really important word in our study of Emily. We've already seen it in poems 71, 122, 125, 128, and 129. We see it here in poem 137. And then 21 more times, and, or 21 more poems, she'll play this game of ecstasy. Notice the, the quest is definitions. You'll remember our study of Socrates and, of course, Plato's, uh, especially Apology and Republic. Remember, the goal is to define the terms. So here, what is it that we're defining when we look at flowers? Can the ecstasy define, and then she'll say it, half a transport, that is to say joy, half a trouble, that is to say sorrow. In other words, 
flowers represent what we see in Taoist philosophy with the yin-yang symbol, right? That is to say, back to Blake, songs of innocence, songs of experience, songs of transport, songs of trouble or sorrow. In other words, flowers can play both games, with which flowers humble men. Uh, colon. Now, I think the word humble is significant. I, I don't think it's a throwaway word. And I think what she's doing is getting us ready for her referencing through the word aesthetics to Aristotle. In other words, what is it that Aristotle says in Poetics specifically about um, uh, the greatness of tragedy? Well, in the end, the pro protagonist, if he's anything, the protagonist is humble to fall. And you'll think of Creon, for example, in Sophocles' Antigone, or of course, obviously, Oedipus and Oedipus Rex. Notice the colon. Anybody, it's almost like a repeat. Anybody can the ecstasy define? Anybody find, and notice we go from define to find, the fountain from which floods to so contra flow. Now, I find this amazing. This is the only time in all of Emily's poetry that she uses the word fountain. And of course, here she's really referencing fountainhead. That is to say, the source from which floods so contra flow. I think it's significant that the word floods also gets used here for any number of biblical reasons and otherwise. I will give him, whoever can give me this information. In other words, this is what I, back to Emily the teacher, back to Emily the student, back to Emily the curious one. She says, if you can tell me why it is that when I look at flowers, I get both a sense of joy as well as sorrow, then here's what I'm going to give you. I will give them all the daisies. Think about how Emily's already identified herself as a daisy in earlier poems. Which upon the hillsides blow, and of course the, the rhyming here with flow uh, matters. Um, you'll remember in poem 26, she said, It's all I have to bring today, this in my heart beside, this in my heart and all the fields and all the meadows wide. Be sure you count, should I forget, someone the sum could tell, this and my heart and all the bees which in the clover dwell. And of course, in our study of that poem, we already were getting ready for our reading of 137. She says, I would love to have somebody explain this to me. Then the break. Then too much pathos. And I find this fascinating because pathos will, we will meet again in poem 719. She'll, uh, she'll play the game this way in 719. A south wind has a pathos of individual voice as one detect on landings an immigrant's address. Now, this idea of pathos, I, I believe, is her connection to Aristotle. Um, too much pathos in their faces for a simple breast like mine. Um, simple is a key word, just like we have said little is a key word and small is a key word. Simple is also a key word. You'll remember um, um, that we've already seen it in poems 23, 42, uh, 45, 57, 91, and 98. She's already used this word simple. And then after this time, in 25 more poems, she'll use the word simple. Uh, it, it's, of course, ironic. I've, I mentioned Socrates earlier. It's, of course, ironic because when she says simple, she means anything but simple. And yet, just look at flowers. I mean, they're obviously simple. There's nothing to them. And yet, notice, for a simple breast like mine, there's too much pathos on their faces. Now, uh, there here is interesting. What is there? Maybe the flower she's referencing. Maybe she's referencing, um, you know, those who would try to play the game of aesthetics. For a simple breast like mine, and then she'll say it, butterflies, you'll remember in Poem 86 are referencing butterflies, from San Domingo, we're talking now, of course, Haiti, cruising round the purple line, the equator, have a system of aesthetics far superior to mine. Now, I'm fascinated by the fact that she references butterflies from San Domingo. In other words, there, there are things that happen in nature which, well, what is it that words were, or that Whitman says in uh, Song of Myself 48, to show a bean in its pod confounds the learning of all time. Um, I think that's exactly what she's saying here. In other words, there are things that happen in nature that defy any kind of simple explanation. She says, the system of aesthetics. Now, she's going to use this phrase, this idea of system, in Poem 749, 1082, and 1134. Each time that we see it, we'll come back to this. System of aesthetics, and again, aesthetics only gets used one time in all of our poetry, and it's right here, far superior to mine. Well, of course, here's the irony of all ironies. That when we're talking about aesthetics theory, and of course the big three of the, the good, the true, and the beautiful, 
The question is, what exactly is going on in regards to flowers? And what is it that makes me, at the same time, Emily asks, both, you know, transported, in other words, joy-filled, and as well, uh, a, a little bit troubled, maybe unsettled, and in that regards, humbled a little bit. Well, I think in 2A, that the message of this poem is that nature does provide both joy and sorrow, and in the process, it does humble us in profound ways. At 2B, I love her word choice. I love that fountain and aesthetics gets used only one time in all of her poetry, and it's right here. At 3A, I, I, I want um, to play a game with you uh, really quickly. By the way, Judith Farr, in her classic treatment of this, um, uh, David Priest, the great Oxford scholar, points out, uh, says that Emily's garden, quote, inhabits the beautiful in its various aspects with painful ease, end quote. I, I love that. I love that quote from far. But I'd like to take you back to our study of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Do you remember in Act 2, Scene 3, the very first time that we meet Friar Lawrence? What is he doing? Well, he's picking flowers. Dope, right? And he says, I must upfill this oyster cage of ours with baleful weeds and precious juice and flowers. The earth that's nature's mother is her tomb. What is her burying grave? That is her womb. And from her womb, children of diverse kind, we suckling on her natural bosom find many for many virtues. Excellent. Interesting, the use of the word virtues, of course, to think of Aristotle. None but for some and yet all different. Oh, mickle is the powerful grace that lies in plants, herbs, and stones. I'm sorry. Oh, mickle is the powerful grace that lies in plants, herbs, stones, and their true qualities. For not so vile that on the earth doth live, but to the earth some special good doth give. Nor aught so good, but strained from that fair use, revolts from Excuse true birth, stumbling speakers. on Please abuse. Virtue itself turns delivery. vice, being misapplied, and, and vice sometime by action Again, dignified. Again, go back to it. Revolts from true birth, stumbling on abuse. Virtue itself turns vice, being misapplied, and vice sometime by action Dignified. Well, of course, the irony of our study of Romeo and Juliet, we've given for lectures at LearnStrong.net, are that the, the very dope that can save us can also obviously kill us. And of course, we have examples of that, uh, 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 obviously, through the study of, of the play. Finally, in 3B, how are you going to own a poem like this? What was a time when nature taught you both joy, transport, as well as some sense of sorrow, that is to say, trouble. When, in fact, the very same thing in nature taught you both of these two things. And obviously, a study of the poems of Emily will do the same. Thank you.